How do we address first responder health and wellness in these days of a pandemic, political unrest, societal upheaval, and the stresses of 21st century life? Let's talk all about it with nurse wellness expert, Dr. Anna fitch right here on episode 303 of The Nurse Keith Show. Hey there, this is Nurse Keith. In these days of the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm still bringing you my monthly pandemic updates at the end of each month. Meanwhile, this podcast continues to be all about you, your personal and professional development, your nursing and healthcare career, and the healthcare system as a whole. And I'm here to share education, ideas, diatribes, and informative interviews with some of the most inspiring people in the worlds of healthcare, nursing, entrepreneurship, medicine, tech, and beyond. I love having you along for the ride, whether you're new to the show or you've been on this journey with me for months or maybe even years. I thank you for being part of the growing Nurse Keith Nation. And remember that Nurse Keith Coach is your destination for all things related to your career and healthcare. So contact me for individualized career coaching for nurses and healthcare professionals anywhere in the world. And if you mention the show, you can get 10% off your first coaching package. The show notes for this episode, where you can learn all about Dr. Anna Fitchcory and her work, will be at nursekeith.com forward slash the word episode and the number 303. So as I mentioned, we're joined today by new friend of the pod, Dr. Anna fitch of AT&T FirstNet. Now, Anna, we're going to talk all about your career history and all the cool things you've done over the years. And But first, I want to ask you a question about what it is we really need to understand about the health and wellness of first responders, especially as 2021 begins. It's at a critical point. First responders have been running towards everything that's being thrown at them in 2020. You know, we jokingly laugh that, oh my gosh, 2020 is the worst year ever. I can't wait until it's over with. But most of us are able to be at home and to continue our professions working from home. Whereas first responders are having to run into COVID-19, the unrest political activity. They are faced with shortages within their ranks as people are retiring or getting sick or not signing up for the academies to come in and become first responders in their own communities. And so they are, and on top of that, their health has always been impacted by the work that they do. Individuals who run towards taking care of people, they're burdens as a result of that calling in their professional lives. And so what we see in the first responder community is actually very similar to what we see in military communities as what, in service members. The rates of PTSD, depression, anxiety, suicide, it's far out see, exceeds the general population. And then when you have those kind of Uh, When you have that cohort of health risks, it has secondary and tertiary effects on the body. Because as you have spoken about over the years, the mind-body spiritual connection is all interrelated. And so if you have these mental impacts that also impact their physical, their spiritual, they have metabolic disorders, cardiovascular disease, rates of cancer, Then you move into alcohol and drug abuse. So I think that when it comes to the issue of first responder wellness is number one, helping to raise awareness to the issue is a a huge component. Most people don't think about the impact of running towards a critical event on the individual. And I think that that's something that we can help educate people about as a part of our work with First Net Health and Wellness. Well said. And I think After 9-11, it came into the public eye to a certain extent and the media, you know, the the firefighters and who ran into the burning buildings and then everyone who was working in the vicinity of the World Trade Center and, you know, the dust and the debris and the lung damage. And, you know, we saw the sequelae of, of, or sequelae, (laughs) however you (laughs) pronounce that word, of, of, that event and the fallout, Mm -hmm. so to speak, of that event. And we talked about the firefighters and what they went through and the police and everybody else that was there and the the 
the regular citizens too, who were breathing in that air for weeks and months to come. So 9-11 kind of brought that to bear. And maybe some people are thinking about it right now in terms of COVID-19. I don't really know how much the media is talking about that. Mm -hmm. I hear the media talking about hospital nurses in the ICU who are doing an amazing job. I mean, that is an incredible place to be in the ER. But when you think about first responders, you know, what would you tell a member of the public? Who are those first responders? What do they do? Mm -hmm. And what, what's their, what's their reason for being like, what's their call to action? Right. I, to care for their communities. Okay. Hands down. So I think if you, if you look at first responders, so in the, pre, the traditional first responder is your police, your firefighters, your EMTs, your dispatch and your emergency management communicators. Those who in the event of an emergency are helping to communicate across all of these different organizations. Now, from a nursing perspective, mm -hmm. because, you know, I love my nurses, yes. is they are also a part of that. So you have the event that all those first responders are running towards it in the traditional sense, your yes. police, your fire, your EMTs. Well, they have to also then coordinate with the healthcare system because ultimately those patients have to interact at some point with the healthcare system in order to improve their health and their well-being or wherever, wherever they are on their health continuum. So it's a very interlocked system between what happens in the community and then what happens in the healthcare system. But getting back to your question, those individuals, I think, feel a deep sense of calling to care for their communities. And, you know, when you talk to first responders, a number of them will tell you that that's all they ever dreamed of being was putting on a police uniform or a firefighter's uniform or an EMT uniform and caring for individuals. And I think sometimes the message of caring and how much they care for their communities is sometimes lost in the aspect of what they do because it's often associated with negative events, you know, but I think a lot of it, what it, there's a real parallel to nursing. We're a caring profession. Nursing is the art and science of caring for individuals. And I think in a lot of ways, the parallel with that with first responders is that art and science of caring for communities. Mm, right. So it's they care for individuals. They run into a burning building, save the person from smoke, you know, smoke inhalation and burning to death and they run the person out. But they're also responding to the community because they're putting out the fire. They're, yes. they're quelling the unrest in the street, what, whatever it happens to be, right? So mm -hmm. first responders are dealing with, with health and wellness, but they're also dealing with the, the physical gravity of an event like 9-11. You know, that's one of our, one of the big ones we think about in terms of first responders. But first responders are out there all the time, every day, oh, yeah. 24 hours a day, Right. Responding to, to everything and anything, whether it's a mental health crisis on the street or it's a, a brawl outside a bar or it's a car accident or a terrorist attack. Right. Yeah. And it's not just responding to, you know, negative human behavior in a community. It's also hurricanes. It's wildfires. Mm -hmm. It's um, it, Las Vegas shooting is another big one in which mm -hmm, public safety yes. is called to respond. Mass shootings. And to care and to make that community safe and then continue the process of, of returning it to where the public feels safe in those areas once again. That's right. That's right. So it's very interesting. You come from a background... You were a clinical nurse in bone marrow transplant and medical surgical intensive care at Duke. That's mm -hmm. in North Carolina, right? That's correct. And Albemarle Regional Hospital. Yes. And you've been a health promotion coordinator with the 1st Infantry Division and Wurstburg Medical um, and where was that? Where were you doing that work? That was actually in Germany. So in I am Germany. a mil yes, I was I'm a military spouse and so wherever my husband takes me I had to take my nursing career with me. And so it was very interesting at the time because I had all this incredible ICU oncology experience and where we were stationed in Germany, they didn't actually have 
a critical care facility in that hospital. They mm. that, that hospital for those soldiers is in a different part of of Germany. And so when I was looking for nursing related jobs, this position as a health promotion coordinator for the 1st Infantry Division opened up and I took that position with zero experience in community health and fell in love with it. I absolutely loved working with all these disparate organizations with this goal to improve the health of that specific community. And that really has been the foundation of my career from that point off. I dearly miss critical care. I love floating to the ER. There's, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I have that rush from an intense experience that I enjoyed in in terms of taking care of patients. But collaboration within a community to really focus on population health Oh, that's my jam. <laughs> yeah, that floats your boat, doesn't it? So it does. And, and I also know back in 2005, you took a position to design the Army Public Health Center Strategic Plan for Community Health Coalitions. And you started a pilot that eventually involved 50 Army and joint installations worldwide. And you were the evaluation and policy project officer for over 16 years. So yeah. you was that before you got a doctorate? Was that even that before, was before that? I got That was before I got a doctorate. I got my, wow. I worked on my doctorate the last three years of that position. And you know, it, I, 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 always feel um, humbled when people talk about my career with the Army. But the truth of the matter, it was a team of experts. I I was not, I was one of many that brought this to fruition. But what, what, what I was able to do with my colleagues is take the framework that we utilized um, in Germany. And I was asked to write an implementation plan for what that would look like for the rest of the Army. And how would we standardize that effort? And so the, the, the framework that we utilized was the National Association for City and County Health Officials Mobilizing Action Through Planning and Partnerships Framework. It's an evidence-based approach to integrating multi, multidisciplinary organizations in a way to effectively strategically plan for the community's health. Hmm. And so by following that framework and, uh, and utilizing the infrastructure that the Army had in place, we were able to go from a pilot site of four installations to 50 Army installations worldwide. Wow. That's incredible. And, you know, a lot of nurses listen to this show, and I interview all sorts of really cool people like you. And, <laughs> you know, people often will say to me, you know, I didn't know I could actually do that as a nurse. Like I knew I could work in the hospital. I knew I could get a job in, you know, ambulatory surgery or I could be a public health nurse or a home health nurse or something or school nurse, right? But nurses don't necessarily know and they're not necessarily taught that they could actually create a strategic plan for community health coalitions that would eventually involve 50 army installations around the world. So for a nurse out there, and we'll get to the work you're doing with AT&T FirstNet in a little bit, but for a nurse out there who, who is like, how, would, how did Anna even make that happen? I mean, is this, is this kind of work something that a nurse could say, yeah, I would like to do these sorts of things? And if they were, how do they make that happen in their careers? What do they do or what do they learn to be able to do something like like you've done and you're doing now? That's a great question. Because I always tell, I always, when I talk about my career, I always explain I've had a very unusual career. Yes. And a lot of it has to do with one of your favorite words, which is network. Mm-hmm. I've never been afraid to talk about what I love, which is health, okay. and what I've done, which has been a lot of different things. And that leads to a conversation that opens up with really unusual point, points of contacts in my network that has led to opportunities. Hmm. And so I didn't know that I could strategically plan for community health when I came out of nursing school. I had no idea that that was where my career would lead me. And honestly, with my new work, if you had told me when I graduated nursing school that I could talk about cellular networks to the degree that I do 
can and do today, I would have laughed at you. Mm -hmm. So I think part of it is building your network and looking at, it is so often we put in search engines for nursing jobs. Well, I would, I would search far and wide for anything that was health you know, and then really dive into what they were looking for and whether I felt like I had the skill set to do that job. And obviously with the health promotion coordinator position, it grew me as an individual. So I added skills through that experience that I could then apply at the next level. When I went to the headquarters level to help create an, an infrastructure and an evaluation plan for how we would do that at more than one army installation. So I think that what's you know, that network, nurses don't network oh, very don't. well. No. And, no. and I, and they are often very afraid to say what they're good at and what makes them, what's their jam, yeah. you know? And so I always tell nurses, don't be afraid to talk about what your passions are. People want to see that caring. People want to hear your enthusiasm for health in whatever aspect of the healthcare system it is. And then that will translate to, other opportunities that are very unique and unusual in the field. Mm-hmm. In, the, in the case, you know, with AT&T, I was not expecting that job. I was having a conversation and I was telling them about, um, I, at the time, I actually didn't know this individual was working for the organization, but we started talking about the health and wellness of first responders. And I had made the comment that it sounded very similar to soldiers and the work that I was doing with the army, which led to a conversation about, well, what does that look like and how do you do it? Mm -hmm. Which led to a phone call that said, you know, would you be interested in talking to us about what that would look like for our organization? So when I try and simplify what I do for AT&T and FirstNet is identifying ways that AT&T and FirstNet can support first responder wellness because it's very important to them. And they want to be engaged in that arena. And part of my skill set is figuring out how, how do we do that? Because AT&T is not a healthcare organization. Right. by any And they have no intention of becoming a healthcare organization. And their, their expertise is technology, wireless, broadband networks, solutions for their customers, and obviously public safety, which we'll get yeah, to. Communication. But yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it, yes, connecting people. Uh-huh. That is a big part of what they do. And so I think that um, one of the things that I've always taken to any jobs, and I, I honestly got this from one of my old bosses, she used to tell me, when we were trying to work with tactical commanders and help them understand why this was important, one of her phrases was help is woven through everything. Mm -hmm. If you can understand the concept that no matter what you do in your life, that help is a part of it in some way, shape, power, and form, you can find a way to integrate health into whatever it is you're doing. And so in the sense with AT&T FirstNet, we're integrating health and wellness into our mission. And Let's just have a disclaimer here that I didn't pay you to talk about networking and tell listeners how important it is, right? <laughs> I didn't pay you. That's true. No, you did not. No. You did not. But I've listened to you long enough <laughs> to know that, one, I would, when I would listen to your shows, I was like, yes, absolutely. That's a large part of it. It's talking to people. It's putting yourself out there. It's, uh, you know, your LinkedIn profile and not being afraid to reach out and ask somebody a question. Right. And so now you're a doctorally prepared nurse who works for AT&T and we're going to unpack that. Okay. And some of that will have to come in the second half. But as we wind down this first half of the conversation, let's first talk about FirstNet. Let's talk about public safety, broadband, wireless networks and what they are because when you and I first had a conversation, gosh, it must have been a few months ago now, and it was really mm-hmm. fun and very educational for me, kind of opened my eyes. What is what does all this mean? Like, what is public safety broadband? Why is it important? Mm-hmm. And going back to 9-11, how yeah. does 9-11 tie into all this? Can you tell the story? Absolutely. That's a great question because uh, I asked that question, what is FirstNet? 
Yeah. You know, what is FirstNet? So FirstNet is a standalone public safety wireless broadband network. And if you walk the dog all the way back to 9-11, if you think back about that period of time in our technical development as a nation, people were starting to use cell phones. The iPhones were becoming increasingly popular. Cellular networks were being built out. And we were utilizing them commercially as individuals, private citizens. But at the same time, public safety individuals were using that same network. Okay. And so whether you were police, law enforcement, EMT, you were on whatever network for whatever plan that you bought with one of the telecommunications firms. I see. Now, what happened during 9-11 is there was a traumatic, critical, unprecedented event to utilize that word one more time this mm-hmm. year. And not only was public safety trying to use that network to get to the Twin Towers, to the Pentagon, to Flight 93 in Pennsylvania, right. but all of our hospital systems were engaging their emergency communications network to try and activate their emergency response plans. Because I remember working all the way down in Virginia Beach that we were being preparing ourselves to receive casualties from the Twin Towers because we were within the radius that would receive sure. if, if necessary, sure. if it was that bad. You know, in those early days, they weren't sure how, how many casualties we were going to have to be um, taking care of. So then we've got public safety trying to use the commercial network. We've got all those individuals who are scared out of their minds mm-hmm. trying to connect with family, maybe say goodbye, yeah. maybe tell them that they're okay. We have tapings from those cellular calls of individuals trying to connect with their families that just will rend a person's heart if you listen to them long Mm -hmm. enough. Mm -hmm. But what that happened is at the same time, there's too much congestion on the network and people were getting dropped. Public safety was not able to connect to do their job. They would, there are recordings that would, uh, a police officer or a firefighter would be trying to connect to ground zero and they would say things like, I'm lost, I'm lost. Or it's been dropped, it's been dropped. And so what what happens as a result of all that congestion on the network is a huge inefficiency Mm. and lag time, dropped calls. And we know in a critical event like that, the number one thing for success is communication. And so the post night, and then we saw repeated patterns of those problems, you know, during Katrina, um, the wildfires in California so on and so forth, when public safety has had to respond in a collective way to an event that's occurred. Well, the Post-9-11 Commission identified that the communications infrastructure was, a, was a part of the problem with the, the lack of communication between the different agencies. And Congress mandated as a result of that commission, the establishment of the First Responder Network Authority And they were charged with building out the first net, which was a standalone broadband wireless network dedicated only to public safety. Mm. And only public safety is allowed to use it. It's band 14, if you want to know on the radio megahertz Mm -hmm. um, where where it falls. And in 2017, AT&T was awarded the contract to build out that network. I see. So we were, were the the net the first net in of itself includes that network the wireless network that's part one, part two is the hardware like your tough books your devices that work on the first net how you communicate it also includes seventy two deployables which are things like cellular towers on the back of trucks Mm. that will drive into a wildfire or to a hurricane to make sure that the cellular network is always available to first responders. There's a blimp called FirstNet One is part of it. And public safety agencies can call up to our response operations group and request when they know a hurricane's coming or something's happening um, they can request those services and we will deploy those assets in support of public safety. Wow. So wait a second. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is completely new to me. So yes. you have 
cellular towers on the backs of trucks that are driven into wildfires and other places where disasters or other types of occurrences are happening so that that keeps the communications open. Yes. And and you even have a blimp that is part of that particular process and network. So I think there's very, very few of us who actually understand that that occurs. Don't you think? Absolutely. Because most most individuals aren't really aware of, again, we've run away from disasters since the general population. And public safety runs towards it. And so you don't necessarily, part of what we're trying to do at AT AT&T is also tell that story because it's very important. And when you see how we have have become a part of the public safety infrastructure as as a result of this work, and we want to be Mm. a part of the public safety infrastructure because we recognize the value of what they bring to our communities, to our stability to our ability to bounce back and recover from events. It's critical. Right. Right. So when we come back from the break, I want to dig into now the 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 connection between FirstNet, mm-hmm. this response network that we're talking about for first response and public safety, and then what you're in charge of, which is responder wellness. Absolutely. And I want to see like, where do these two meet and how do these programs kind of build on each other? And then how, say, a nurse out there listening wants to kind of kind of connect with this particular process that you're involved in and the benefits therein. So we're going to come back for the second half of episode 303 to talk all about it. So we'll be right back. So now we're going to take a pause for the cause for just a moment. Please consider becoming a patron of The Nurse Keith Show, just like other awesome listeners who value the show so much that they want to give just a little bit each month to support the work we're doing here. When you pledge, you not only get the satisfaction of helping produce and support The Nurse Keith Show, you also get some pretty cool premiums and gifts from yours truly. Just head over to patreon.com forward slash Nurse Keith to read all about it. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Nurse Keith. And if you know someone who could benefit from career coaching with me, please consider referring them. And if they become a paying client, you'll receive credit for an hour of coaching with me. And there's no expiration date on that credit, so you can keep it in your back pocket until you need it most. And remember that you can refer as many people as you like and continue to earn those coaching credits. What an incredible deal. And please head over to nursekeith.com and sign up for my newsletter, which comes out regularly and brings you supportive messages, updates from my blog and my podcast, resources, and all sorts of other stuff. Remember, nursekeith.com, sign up for that newsletter, and you'll also get a free download from me as my gift to you. Anyway, those are my sincere asks today. So now, Let's dig back into today's topic without further ado. And thanks for hanging out here on episode 303 of the Nurse Keith Show. We are at nursekeith.com forward slash episode 303. That's where you can read the show notes all about AT&T, First Responder Health and Wellness, FirstNet, and the work that Dr. Anna Fitch Corey is doing as the Director of Responder Wellness at AT&T FirstNet. So, Anna, right before this, you kind of blew my mind right before the (laughs) break that we talked about the trucks with with cell towers on them that drive into wildfires and disasters so that first responders can always contact each other. We talked about what happened at 9-11 when those cellular networks in that very, uh, the infancy of that particular uh, um, type of technology couldn't really handle the traffic that was happening in the aftermath of those planes hitting the Pentagon and Flight 93 and the Twin Towers in New York City. And we also talked a little bit about, well, quite a bit about your work with the Army and how you got involved in doing some pretty incredible, like very, you know, pull back the camera, look at this like bird's eye view of, of response and connection and communication and technology. 
So in this half, I want to talk about a little more about FirstNet, Band 14, and what that means. But then I want to talk about AT&T, this first responder health and wellness thing that, that has born, been born of it. So when FirstNet was created, I, doesn't, I didn't hear from you that Congress mandated that we have a first responder health and wellness program. Nope. I heard they wanted the communication, and that was from the 9-11 Commission. That's correct. Right? That's correct. So, and AT&T was awarded the, the what did you say, the contract, it's, it's contract to build this out, and that was in 2012? 2017. 17. So, this network was being built before 2017, then AT&T came in in 2017 to really expand it more more broadly? Is that what happened? Yes. So the build out of it is um, the infrastructure, like the cell mm-hmm. towers that you have to build out to have increased coverage over the United States, especially in many of our rural areas. So right. because a lot of times things don't just happen in a convenient location where we have, you know, great uh, connectivity. And so part of what we're doing is expanding the network so we have coverage across the United States and where we don't have coverage across the United States on the band 14 itself, what AT&T is committed to doing is a couple of different things. One, they will prioritize first responders on our commercial network. So if there is an event, they can actually utilize uh, traffic on the commercial network that's called uplifting them. And Mm -hmm. so that between band 14 and the commercial network, public safety is able to communicate and respond to event. Now it's also building out where we don't have towers. So currently we have 80% of the network built out. And we're we're on track to complete it by, I believe by the end of the calendar year. Uh, Don't hold me to that. I'm not in charge remotely of of the build out, but what we do have 80% of the network, physical network built out. And where we don't, we have the capabilities to either uplift from the commercial network or utilize those deployables that we talked about to support response to events. So what that coverage looks like in terms of additional numbers is there's one point, right now we have about 1.7 million users, first responders on the FirstNet and over 14,000 public safety agencies. Wow. That's, that's a lot of people and a lot of agencies and a lot of, what would you call it? Capacity. Yes. Right. Or capacity building. So 14,000 agencies, you said, so does that mean fire departments, yes. police departments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Yes. And now, now the armed forces, the national guard, all of that, they have their own communication networks. No, right? that's there separate. Are Nash, national guard units, um, I, I don't, I can't speak for their specific contracts because it depends where sure. we're talking about, but yes, they can be, they be eligible for being on first net as well. I see. And my assumption is, is that, you know, we have, like I live in New Mexico, mm-hmm. which is a very, very rural state where I think the third least populous state by square mile in the country, I think. Wyoming, Montana, Mm -hmm. the Dakotas, I think those are also very extremely rural. So getting coverage for cellular service, especially for first responders in those areas must be really challenging. And then if we have fires in very, very remote areas, like here in Santa Fe, we recently had a fire up in the um, Santa Fe National Forest that was quite it was a quite remote fire. Mm-hmm. Those are very difficult to get to. Yes. So part of what you're doing here is creating deployables and other systems or very intricate systems so that that's all covered. So this is probably news to a lot of folks and it's something that could be very eye-opening, maybe even to some folks who work in ERs, for instance. And I want to ask a question because... I've heard this from ER nurses, I know, but I don't really understand it. So let's say there's a big disaster, let's say a chemical plant disaster or something, mm-hmm. and ambulance, ambulances and fire departments respond and police respond. And then they're on their way getting dispatched to different hospitals. So they need to connect directly with the 
emergency departments. So yes. does that happen on band 14 as well? Yes. Is that where they're calling into the triage nurse or whoever at the ER saying, hey, we've got 27 casualties. Mm -hmm. So how does that system work? So those of us who don't understand it can have a grasp. Absolutely. And I'll try and answer it in as much layman speak as I, I possibly can. Go for it. So <laughs> if, <laughs> and like I said, you know, when I went to nursing school, I had no idea I'd be able to speak about cellular networks. No. So, um, you I'll, thought you were dealing with cells, <laughs> like human cells. Uh, and um, all right. So the, it's about interoperability, right? Between okay. agencies. That's what yeah. FirstNet is trying to, to work with. And so that they can communicate and not lose their cellular connection and be on the same network and, and not get kicked off by commercial. You know, there's only one first net and yeah. the, this is the one for public safety. So our first responders, not all of them, but you know, if they're on the first net and they have a first net account, they can still call to that hospital. If that hospital is not necessarily on the first net, it's not like you have to have, uh -huh. you know, magical walkie talkies that communicate only to each other. No, that's not the case because okay. it's about interoperability. We want to be able to respond no matter what. Now, it is to the benefit of that hospital or that nurse, that ER nurse or ER doctor to have a first net account themselves because then they, their individual accounts won't get kicked off. Like, so this, this, the first responders will be on the first net. And so they'll have that priority and preemption and they can still communicate to the hospital. But if it's a bad situation uh, and the hospital is, is competing on whatever network they are on, it is to the benefit of mm -hmm. that hospital and those nurses or doctors that have to respond to have devices that can communicate without getting dropped um, with those first net devices. So it, it right. helps improve the communication between the healthcare system and the public safety system because most people don't necessarily think of healthcare as you know, pure public safety, but in our ERs, they are, because that's where the people are going to go to get, you know, as I mentioned, their care and hopefully recover from this event. To get stabilized, right. It's exactly, exactly. I see. So, so if they can't reach the hospital and they have 27 casualties and they don't know that that hospital's almost at capacity mm -hmm. at that moment, and they can only take five patients, then they don't know that they have to redirect patients and casualties to other hospitals in the area or maybe further afield or bring in a life Absolutely. flight or something. So, so this is all this very important interconnection and interoperability is the word that you just used. So, so now I want to kind of change channels, so to speak, to use your <laughs> language. <laughs> and I want, now I want to make the connection between AT&T FirstNet Band 14, and then their first responder health and wellness initiatives you're doing. So how, since that wasn't nope. mandated by Congress and didn't come out of the 9-11 Commission, is this something AT&T decided, oh, we're providing all this interoperability for communication for first responders, so now we're going to bring in a health and wellness initiative for first responders. Is that what happened? Yes and no. Um it goes a little bit deeper than that. So if you're aware at, at an organizational or corporate level that organizations have value statements, right? So if you're building, most organizations, if you're not aware of this, your hospital has them too. Uh, yes. Most corporations have value statements and it's, it's a vision of who they are as a corporation. Yeah, their vision and mission, yes. so to speak. So one of AT&T's value statements is to be there. And that's to be there for your communities, for your customers, and for each other. And mm -hmm. the FirstNet Health and Wellness Program is an embodiment of that ideal. We have a very visionary leader, uh, Jason Porter. He is mm -hmm. um, the senior vice president for FirstNet, built with AT&T. And he is a West Point graduate and has a huge heart and belief in the health and wellness of individuals. And he said to me when I met him, 
I want to do something for first responder health and wellness. I'm not really sure how to do that. It's not my background. It's not, we're not a healthcare organization, but he's, he has worked with so many of the different first responder associations and heard their stories of PTSD and suicide and depression. Mm -hmm. And he raised his hand and said, I want to be a part of the solution and I'm going to commit resources to supporting this effort. And that's where I kind of come into, came into play is I had met Jason and we had discussed this and that's how I got, I, I was offered this job to help them identify how is a corporate organization a part of first responder health and wellness? It fits very, very clearly as a part of our values as a corporate organization. Mm -hmm. It's about connecting. It's about communication. It's about a network of people that support each other. And I think one of the one of the quotes that I use when I'm talking about first responder health and wellness is you can't have community without caring. And if we're going to be a part of this community, we want to demonstrate that ability to care for first responders because you're right. We have no contractual obligation to address first responder health and wellness. We're doing it because it's the right thing to do. And we recognize that no matter, we, we built a beautiful, amazing wireless broadband network. But we also recognize that without the people, it's just a network. And so part of that mission is integrating that sense of caring into how we provide that wireless broadband network to for public safety. And that's what we're hoping to achieve with the health and wellness program is bringing people together, uh, finding that strong voice to address public safety, health and wellness in a couple of different ways. Okay. So let's unpack that. Um, Okay. How are you actually addressing first responder health and wellness? Are they, are they classes, courses, outreach, um, education, you know, what are the ways in which you you are reaching and want to reach first responders? Mm-hmm. And how do first responders actually find you or how do you find them? Right. So that's a great question. And it's complicated. <laughs> really? So, uh, I'm so uh, surprised. Uh, uh, this, is where, <laughs> this is where Dr. Corey is going to come out a little bit. because okay, Paging so Dr. You, Corey. Okay. Yes, exactly. So, you, you know... They're different in the socio-ecological model of how we influence health. Okay. You can influence health at the individual level. You can influence health at the unit, like a community, a group, a family, you know, a little bit bigger okay. than, than the individual. The next level up is organizations, communities, and that final level is that federal policy infrastructure level of addressing health. Right. Okay. So at and is like, as I've mentioned previously, we're not delivering healthcare services. That's not the nature of our organization. So when we looked at what, what and how do we get involved in the health and wellness of first responders, we had to look at those upper tiers of organizational community and relationships and the network at that higher level, Mm -hmm. on the systems level of how do we influence the system of addressing first responder health and wellness. And so we have several internal existing capabilities that support this effort. So number one, what do we do? We are a communications network. So part of it is awareness, part of it is education and helping to listen from our associations. So there are, our associations are the expert in their people. And when I say associations, I'm talking about the associations that represent the law enforcement, the firefighters, the EMTs, the nurses, so on and so forth. They have done amazing work in supporting first responder health and wellness. And so part of it is supporting them and helping them communicate what their message is and oh. their capabilities to um, first responders. And so we, we have designed and developed um, our messaging as a part of how we talk about first responder health and wellness. Because, you know, when you're unpacking stigma, 
the first thing is you got to talk about it. So mm-hmm. if we're not talking about depression, PTSD and anxiety of first responders, we have to acknowledge that there is a, pro- a, a problem so that before we can ever begin to fix it. And so we, w- we are messaging, this is an issue and there are resources out there. So helping connect and use the network to speak about the problems and identify the resources that are already out there and help get that message out is integral to our plan at, at, at FirstNet. We also have, um, as if you recall, the FirstNet is not just the network. It's also those deployables, the mm-hmm. hardware. Mm-hmm. But there's also a software capability. So we have an app catalog that has different sorts of applications that can be used on the smartphones that first responders are uh, using in their work. And so we began when I came on identifying health and wellness applications that support first responders so that they can use them on their first net devices. We make sure that they meet our security, our cybersecurity requirements. Um, we make sure that I assess them to make sure that there's some sort of evidence based in underlying the, the structure of that application. And then we help educate the first responders that are on the first net, what apps are available that support their health and wellness. So we're building that out right now as we speak. I see. So so if AT&T is about communication and first net's about communication, then what you're doing in terms of first responder health and wellness is also about communication and also connection because you're not creating health and wellness initiatives and programs because they exist already. So you're actually helping those first responders actually know about these things and you're using messaging, which again circles back to communication saying, hey, suicide among first responders is a thing. And if we don't want it to be the elephant on the table, we actually want to talk about it, right? Or depression, anxiety, substance use disorders. I mean, we know, I've seen the, the numbers out there that in the United States, we lose about one physician a day to suicide. It's approximately 400 a year, more or less. And we don't even know if COVID-19 has actually increased that number or not. We assume it is. I don't know many numbers, or I haven't heard specific numbers about nurses, but we know it's a thing. We know it's an mm-hmm. issue, and it's probably much bigger than we think. Now, I have not seen anything anywhere in my peregrinations on the internet about first responder suicide and substance use disorders and depression and PTSD. You probably have your finger on the pulse of that, I would assume, right? to dig into that data. I I had a sense from my military work that was very similar just because of the nature of the jobs that there's very, there are commonalities between going to war and going to crisis. And so it's not exactly the same, but there are similarities. So I had some assumptions coming into the job, but I also wanted to challenge those biases that I had. And so I dove into the literature uh, and I still do every day because I would I, I actually would tell you I don't consider myself an expert in first responders, health and wellness, at least not yet. I'm working on it. But um, I, bet you are. I had to dive into the literature to become more comfortable with it. Yeah. And so, but PTSD and depression, five times the rate of the general population. Five they're times. They're more likely to yes, wow. they're more likely to die by um well, suicide than in the line of duty. And so there's, and then you add on, you know, alcohol and drug abuse, and it, it's all interrelated. So it's it's hard to lay out this, the statistics are not necessarily these clean cut, and there's variations across the different um, disciplines. So there, there'll be some, you know, there's specific issues that face firefighters, for example, their, their risk for cancer is just tremendous as a result of their jobs. And so that is a huge priority in in the firefighting field. And then um, on the EMT and nursing side, they struggle with acute stress disorder, PTSD, depression, a lot of it tied to burnout and caregiver fatigue as a a nature of that that patient um, provider interaction. Mm -hmm. It it is, is something that we all know exists, especially in nursing. And there are things that can be done 
to be protective factors when you're faced with that kind of disaster on a regular basis. So this is a really, really interesting initiative. And I hope that you'll be able to share with me some links that people might be able to go to from the show notes. And if you happen to have any embeddable videos or anything that we could put in the show notes, that would be great. I'd like people to learn more about this. And especially Mm -hmm. if there's first responders out there, ER nurses, flight nurses, EMTs, paramedics, those folks listening in who want to figure out like, how can they learn more about this? That would be great. And um, going back to now to FirstNet itself, you were saying that, that nurses, physicians, those who work in the ER, for instance, can have a FirstNet enabled device and they can actually have mm-hmm. their own FirstNet account. So yes. if somebody's saying to out loud right now, like, how do I actually do that? How do they actually sign up for FirstNet and have that connectivity themselves? Mm-hmm. So that's a great question. Yeah. So the easy, the easiest answer is they should go to firstnet.com. So there are eligibility requirements. So just like, just as I mentioned, this is a very specific network for specific people because of the nature of the jobs that they do. Yes. You do have to demonstrate that you are, that you meet the criteria as a firstnet primary or extended primary user. Okay. And so they will ask things for your license and you know, um, I think you have to demonstrate who you work for and then they determine at what level um, your FirstNet account would be created. Okay. So the easiest way is to go to firstnet.com and, and talk to one of our customer service reps because it's, it's very specific to that individual and the jobs that they're doing. Or you can go to your local AT&T store, quite honestly. All mm-hmm. of the service representatives in there, uh, if you walked in and said, hey, I'm interested in signing up for FirstNet, they can walk you through that process as well so that you can have a FirstNet um, account. account and then or, or a FirstNet device. So I actually, um, I know you can't see it on a podcast, but I have a FirstNet device and it, it literally says, you know, where you would see um, your connectivity to the bars. It sure. says when you're on the FirstNet and the speed is Astounding. Yeah. I, I mean, I have both a commercial account and a uh, a FirstNet account, and I'm it's it's amazing the difference. Any teenager would want to have that, <laughs> but they're not qualified. But they can't. <laughs> right? Any teenager teenager would like. How can I get mom's phone? Um, yeah. Now, okay. So, a couple questions before we end. When a nurse is thinking about this, for instance, does that mean they have to switch to AT and T to have FirstNet? No, no, not no. So if you have an if you have an existing AT and T um, cellular account, mm-hmm. then you can be switched from AT and T over to FirstNet. Right. Obviously, because they're an existing customer. If you come from a different network, you can switch that account and become a FirstNet right. user. So they don't have to switch to AT and T if they they don't want to. Okay. Now. Does this cost that nurse or physician or EMT money to join FirstNet? Well, it's it's like for their personal account, it's mm-hmm. like a cellular account. So um, again, don't quote me on the numbers. I want to, and I think it depends on different things you select on that FirstNet okay. account. But it's something like thirty nine dollars a month, mm-hmm. uh, uh, roughly speaking, um, and so. Yes, it costs for your personal account. Now, obviously, if your agency has an agency FirstNet agreement and they provide you with your FirstNet phone, then you as an individual are not paying for that. Your company would be paying for it. Oh, so a whole hospital or an ER or a flight company might have a FirstNet Mm -hmm. account and then everybody kind of gets that. It's like being on a family account, so to speak. So, so to speak. Okay. So we've got FirstNet itself, which is that network band 14, that public safety and ERs and flight companies and all those use that to communicate in disasters and all those sorts of things that we have to make sure they can always be in communication. And we have all the deployables and the things you talked about that AT&T has built out and is building out 
you're at about 80% capacity. So there's coverage all over the country. And then we have your first net first responder health and wellness initiative, which sort of was like the, the, the child of first net because you realized, oh, we're supporting the communication. So we actually have to look at the health and wellness of these amazing people doing amazing work in the world, right? They're not Absolutely. telecommuting from home. They are out there like doing this really hard <laughs> work. So this is sort of a, it's a two prong effort, but they're interconnected. And yes. as a doctorally prepared nurse, you were brought in through your, as you said, networking and talking to people and doing really cool things in the, the course of your career to, to come in and head this up. And again, you were saying, what did you say? Oh, that, that when you graduated from nursing school, you never thought you would know so much about <laughs> cellular communication. You knew about like adenosine triphosphate and mitochondria <laughs> and all that kind of cellular communication. So Absolutely. it's just different. But it is. you know, this really goes to show like this is to some extent a career podcast, but it's a lot more than mm-hmm. that now. I've really widened the depth and breadth of the show, but in the end, you're a living example here of, of a nurse who's created a very interesting, fascinating career that you never would have expected all this stuff you've done. And I'll have your bio there in the, um, in the show notes too for people to read. And it's really fascinating all the things you've done. And I, I really want to thank you for your time. And thanks to at and for creating, you know, this program for first responders and, you know, it does take a community and we are in a time of, again, early 2021, we're in a time of this ongoing pandemic and we still unfortunately have things like mass shootings and natural disasters and, you know, all sorts of stuff that happens that first responders are right there. So thanks for being part of that infrastructure to really bring some really great things to those people who are doing that great work. And I think you're, you're an amazing nurse leader and I'm sure you're going to do some even more amazing things over the next 20, 30 years. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's an honor. It's yeah. an honor to serve. Um, I I definitely come from the perspective of being a servant leader. Yes. And I it's a pleasure to serve people who give so much. So yeah. I hope I hope I do great things, but only because that means that I've done something to help public safety in their health and wellness. Yeah. Well, in the end, what you're doing is what nursing is all about, right? So we learn that about communities and individuals make up communities and communities make up societies. So you're just, you're part of that interconnected web. And so thanks for that great work. And thanks for giving us your time today. Absolutely. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Well, there you have it. Thanks for listening to this awesome episode of the Nurse Keith Show. And remember, you can read all about Anna Fitchcory doctor, Anna Fitchcory, and AT&T FirstNet and their first responder health and wellness programs at nursekeith.com forward slash the word episode and the number 303. I hope you feel uplifted, empowered, and maybe inspired by Dr. Corey about how you can create a career that's pretty out of the box like hers. And remember, you can contact me if you want some help creating that career that you want. Contact me, mention the show, and get 10% off your first coaching pack. And remember, there are job listings at nursekeith.com. There are great resume templates from Amanda Guarnier at the Resume RX and so much more. And remember that the Nurse Keith Show is a member of Ars Longa Media, a collaborative network of podcasts and media entities dedicated to professional education and partnering to improve social ills. They are at arslonga.media, A-R-S-L-O-N-G-A.media. And the Nurse Keith Show is a proud member of the Health Podcast Network. Network. Speaking of communications networks, it's one of the largest and fastest growing collections of authoritative, high quality podcasts taking on the tough topics in healthcare with empathy, expertise, and commitment to excellence. Along with the Nurse Keith Show, you will find the podcast from the Journal of the American Medical Association, podcast from the Mayo Clinic, the New England Journal of Medicine, Kevin MD 
pen nursing, and so much more. The Nurse Key Show is adroitly produced by Rob Johnston of 520R Podcasting, and Mark Cappy Spieson is our stalwart social media ringmaster. I always feel grateful to Mark and Rob for keeping the wheels turning in the right direction. Be well, dig deep, seek joy, keep in touch. This is Nurse Keith Singh, adios. Until next time from beautiful Santa Fe, New Mexico. And we have Dr. Anna fitch saying see you later from... Columbia, South Carolina. Columbia, South Carolina. Thank you, Dr. Corey. Thank you, Anna. Thanks to everyone. And we will catch you on the flip side. 